so glad trouble don't Pastor Willie Paul of the New Horizon Baptist Church, and I'd like to take this time to say welcome. Even during this time of social distancing, I need to remind all of you that we are still a church family. Therefore, if any need arises, please call the church and leave a message. Our number is 423 622 
423-622-2077. That's 423-622-2077. I also would like to remind all of you the importance of our tithes and our offerings. Tithes and offerings can be dropped off at the church on Sundays between the hours of 1 p.m. and 6 p.m. You also have the option of using the Giblify app. If any of these uh, steps are not convenient for you, please make sure you call the church and leave a message. Uh, we will be here and available for whatever your needs might be. Let us now at this time pause for a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you once again for allowing us an opportunity to be in your presence and to introduce your word that we might gain strength, guidance, and most of all, that we might grow in such a way that you will be pleased with who we are. We pray for those individuals, uh, victims of uh, the coronavirus, all of the families who have lost loved ones. We are ever mindful of the fact of your awesomeness, even in a time of disaster. Cover us now as we make preparation to get into your word that we might grow and develop and allow our lights to shine in the midst of these dark moments. And we're going to be so careful to give you praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just before we get into the word of God, um, you are all welcome as we prepare to read in unison our statement of preparation. And it simply reads, Dear Lord, I come before thee as an empty vessel. Open my ears that I might hear. Open my eyes that I might see. Open my mind that I might understand. Open my heart that I may receive your word. We have been dealing with a series of messages taken out of First Kings chapter 19. We have used as a theme for these messages the cause and cure of depression. The cause and cure of depression. Um, I think that it's very fitting at this particular time with what we are all dealing with that we understand that we serve a God who is still on the throne and above all who has all power. We have already gotten deep into our message so what I like to take the time to do is simply back up and explain to our listeners today to bring you up to speed as to where we actually are at this time. We have already dealt with verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. First of all, we started our messages off in outline form talking about the report to Jezebel. And this was found in verse 1 of our text, which simply reads, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. This is a situation of where Elijah had gone up on top of Mount Carmel with King Ahab and came out victorious um, in, in destroying all of the false bells of prophets that were present. Also, we move from the report because King Ahab had given this information unto Jezebel. So then we took a look at verses 2 and 3, and it is here that we discussed the response to the report. And this response was twofold. 
in verse 2 of that chapter, we looked at the response of Jezebel. And this is a statement you will find in verse 2 of the text after King Ahab had mentioned the uh, event to Jezebel. And verse 2 simply says, Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. So this was the response of Jezebel after receiving the report. Then in verse 3 of the text, we dealt with the response of Elijah. And verse 3 simply reads, And when he saw that he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. So the response to the report we discussed in detail was simply twofold. The response of Jezebel, and then secondly, the response of Elijah. And based on Elijah's response, I shared with you two important points. The first one was that we recognized in verse 3 that Elijah changed his focus. Secondly, not only did Elijah change his focus, but Elijah allowed the change of focus to change him, his course. He got off course. So we discussed in details those two important points. Then we arrived at verse 4 of the text. And it is here that I emphasize that Elijah uh, stepped out and made a desperate, despairing cry. Verse 4 of the text simply reads like this. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree and he prayed that he might die and said it is enough now Lord take my life for I am no better than my father's so we laid all of this information out and then we arrived at the fact that now Elijah finds himself in a strange place under a broom tree or a juniper tree. And as he sat here, I laid out for us uh, bullets concerning what brought up or what led up to Elijah's spirit of depression. And I emphasize the fact that all of us have been there. First important thing we mentioned was that he was physically drained. Physically drained. That is, he simply was tired. Then secondly, he was emotionally drained. Emotionally drained. Thirdly, he focused on his problem. Next, he was lacking in fellowship. And finally, he was lacking in faith. Now in today's message, we want to continue from where we dropped off on last Sunday. And that is, we now begin to take a look at 1 Kings chapter 19 verses 5, 6, and 7. It is in these verses that uh, I use as a subtopic under our theme, and that is blessed in a strange place. Blessed in a strange 
place. I emphasize and remind all of you that all of us, right as I speak this very moment, may find ourselves in a strange place. What is happening across the country by our church doors being closed and shut down, we find ourselves in a strange place. On last Sunday, I shared with you two things of importance regarding Elijah in this strange place. In order to understand these two major bullets that will lead us further into our text, I want to read now for your hearing 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 5. And it simply reads, Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Arise and eat. Just looking at verse 5 of the text, I shared with you, first of all, the answer to prayer. And what we mean by that is, if you were back up in your Bibles, you would take note that in verse 4 of the text, Elijah prayed, asking God to take his life. But when we arrive at verse 5, we recognize that God did not answer Elijah's prayer. And it just might be that, first of all, God had greater things and more for Elijah to do. The second thing that we emphasize was that of the angel's appearance. The angel's appearance. And that is, I shared with you that even in the midst of uh, being in a strange place, that Elijah recognize or we see that God shows up in Elijah's strange place. A certain part of verse 5 that I want to deal with to show us a number of lessons that can be learned is found in the phrase, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat now, now as we begin to take an in-depth study of this phrase there are a number of valuable lessons that we see here the very first thing that comes to mind is that we learn here that the presence of the Lord shows up in Elijah's strange place he shows up. Before we go any further, I need to remind us that although many of us are in a strange place, some of us may have been in strange places even before the virus became an issue. The point is, I need to remind us that despite your strange place, that in order to understand the remaining of the message, you need to make sure you accept the fact that God will show up in your strange place. Now the question is, how is it possible that we can know God's presence and be guaranteed of his presence in our strange places? Well, first... We must understand this, that God's presence can be experienced by those who truly desire it. In other words, despite your circumstance, despite your strange place, if you have a desire for God's presence to dwell strongly in your midst, he will show up. I will give you proof of the importance of your desire taken from a statement that um, 
David shares with us out of Psalm 27, verse 4. Listen to what David said. David said, one thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And now we've looked closely at that verse. It's two things that David makes mention of in the verse that we might want to uh, discuss and be clear on. First, David mentions the house of the Lord. Then secondly, he says his temple. So the ultimate question is, what does David have reference to when he says the house of the Lord or the temple? Well, first, David may be speaking regarding the tabernacle in Gibeon, which is nothing more than the temporary sanctuary he had put up the house and the ark of the covenant. Or... It is possible that when David says temple, he has reference to the temple that his son Solomon was to build. But David could have used the word temple to actually have reference to the presence of the Lord. If that is the case, then that tells us that all of us as believers, when we find ourselves in strange places, that we must focus on what our real desires might be. I want you to keep this in mind, that your circumstances in life does not determine your desire for the Lord's presence. In other words, you can never allow your circumstances to change what you desire. I may be in a strange place. There may be some things happening to me, but I cannot allow what surrounds me to interfere with my ultimate desire. So the first thing that we must keep in mind is that God's presence can be experienced by those who truly desire it. That means his presence will go beyond your circumstance. Nobody but God can reach through troubled times and touch his children like he can. Nothing. No, no better situation. Improving your circumstance won't do it. What has to happen is that you must stay focused with your desire and not look at your circumstances. Second thing I need to remind us of is that God's presence is often experienced in difficult times. Many times when we as believers are confronted with trying times, we have a tendency to constantly pray, Lord, deliver me. We want out. We want God to quickly open up a door. We want to make a way of escape. But sometimes God will allow us to linger in our awkward situations, in our strange places. Sometimes God does not quickly take us out of the storms of life's problems. But one thing we must understand is that God does promise us. Now let me make it very clear that you cannot lose bullet one and not grab just bullet two. You got to put the two together. That means now that there are moments that when you have the right desire for the presence of God, that God will show up at difficult times in your life. Once again, let me focus on the psalmist and his statement in Psalm 34 verses 18 and 19. Reading from the New King James Version, it simply reads, The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. 
He goes on to say, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Now notice what you are finding in that text. He, he offers us deliverance, but he doesn't tell us the time. That means that there are times, there are moments that God will leave you in that storm, leave you in that strange place. So we must focus on the idea that if I have a strong desire for his presence in difficult times, that my desire will remind me that God is going to provide a way of escape. And the reason that is important, simply because God promises to be close to those individuals who have broken hearts, those of us who get troubled sometimes in our spirit, being in a strange place. God promises us that he will provide a way of escape. And if you don't get nothing else out of the message, make sure you understand this. Never allow Satan to wreck your desire because God may not take me out of the storm, but God will be in the storm with me and the stronger my desire becomes, the less I focus on my circumstances. This is important because God promises to be our power. He promises to provide us with courage. He promises to be our wisdom. So we must maintain two important things. My, our desire for his presence. And secondly, we must never lose sight that although I am confronted with a difficult time, God's presence is revealed in those moments. Now, let us take a look at how God made his presence known to Elijah in this strange place. He shows up, and the text says in verse 5, I know we've read it for your hearing, but let me simply read that portion of, of Scripture again to remind us. The text says, and suddenly... An angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Now, there are several important things I want to bring to your attention just found in this phrase. First, you see that God made his presence known through an angel. Now, that word angel, the word angel here is translated messenger. And that is, it is translated messenger both in the Hebrew as well as in the Greek. But what is unique is if you will slide down in your Bibles and look now at verse 7 in this same chapter, the angel is given a name. And you should see that the angel is called the angel of the Lord. Now, this is an Old Testament title for the second person of the Godhead. And we all know that the second person of the Godhead is Jesus Christ. In fact, the presence of this angel is called or known as a theophany. And a theophany is a unique experience. First of all, the word theophany comes from a Greek word which simply is theophania. And not only is that important, but if you split that, first of all, theos is actually the meaning of, refers to God. Then secondly, we have the phania, which means manifestation. And if you put the two together, you arrive at a clear understanding, and that is a theophany simply means a manifestation of God. Now, that ought to make all of us jump up and shout and give God praise, glory, and honor. It simply teaches us that even in the Old Testament, that in dealing with Elijah, God saw a need to show up. 
So the Lord showed up in Elijah's strange place. And let me remind you, he will show up in your strange place. So God made his presence known through an angel. The second thing that I want to bring to your attention is this, that God sent an angel to Elijah to minister to him. Now let's talk about that for a moment. Notice what the angel was not sent to do. The angel was not sent, first of all, to thrash him. Secondly, he was not sent to rebuke him for his fearfulness, nor was he sent to answer his prayer request found in verse 4 of the text that God might take his life. So the first thing is God sent the angel not to do any of those things. The second thing I need to bring to your attention is that God sent the angel while Elijah was asleep. Now you might say, what is so unique about all of this? Well, let's go in depth that we might get a clear understanding. Elijah was not the only one found in scripture that God sent an angel to wake him up. The apostle Peter in the New Testament was also awakened by an angel according to Acts chapter 12 verse 7 which reads, Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him and a light shone in the prison and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up saying, Arise! quickly and his chains fell off his hands some of us are just like Elijah or even Peter and we need to be awakened by God through an angel there are two major areas that I want to quite quickly tap on first of all some of us are sleep physically that simply means that there are believers, there are individuals that come into the house of the Lord constantly, Sunday after Sunday, and, and, and you go to sleep. You physically fall asleep. Then there are those of us who are not physically asleep, but we are spiritually asleep. Doesn't matter, either one, physically or spiritually. If we find ourselves in either one of these categories, it is extremely important that we recognize we need to be awakened. We as believers need to wake up and be about our father's business. I think it takes a, a situation. It takes moments. And I'm hoping and praying that even as we find ourselves today, in strange places, all because of the coronavirus, that we recognize we cannot afford. If this does not wake some of us up, I wonder what kind of relationship we actually have with God. These kind of trying times, these are moments we need to allow him to just wake us up so that we as believers will be about our Father's business. The third thing I need to share with you is that I want you to notice that God knew best what Elijah needed. God knew that his tired and weary child, first of all, needed food and he needed rest. But he also, as I shared with you, needed spirit spiritual awakening notice now that Elijah was awakened that he might receive nourishment Peter was awakened according to the book of Acts that he might walk out a free man this teaches us that God knows best 
how to minister to his children. Many times as believers, we think that it is our job. We do this even in prayer. We don't trust God. We feel as though we are giving God guidelines. We're giving him a recipe. We're telling him things that we see need to be done. And we got it all messed up. We need to understand it is not our job to move forth with that kind of talk with God. God's angels are sent to minister unto us. So we need to sometimes recognize how we pray, how we communicate with God, how we worship. And that is we got to give God full control, total control control because he knows best how to minister to us i think sometimes even in the local church we mess up in various ministries because we bring to the table in leadership positions over various ministries our own agenda as where we really should take a moment and say god what do you desire what is it that you see needs to be done God will send angels to watch over us because God knows best what we need. Let's go a little bit further and, and, and talk about the fact that God's angels are really his special ambassadors. He sent them that they might minister unto us. Let, let me prove a few things. First of all, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 1 verse 14 made this statement are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation that's a powerful statement you have to recognize that our ultimate goal is that that statement or for those who will inherit salvation. So that means for those of us who are in the family of God, we have the blessed assurance of knowing that God dispatches his angels that will watch over us. If that's not enough, let's go a little bit further. The psalmist in Psalm 91 verse 11 says this to us, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways that means all my ways that is my actions everything that I do that also allows us to understand that God loves me so much he will follow me and go with me when I go in the wrong direction he is still with me I can prove that because in the Great Commission, Jesus himself said, Lo, I am with you always. And that is extremely important for us as believers to understand that we must develop this attitude that no matter what goes down, the presence of God is with me simply because he teaches us in the word that just as he dispatched an angel to watch over Elijah, he likewise releases angels to watch over us. I can recognize and see already that many of you all are still yet doubtful of the importance of God allowing his angels to minister to us. But before I give you some examples, I, I want you to quickly understand that this is why scripture teaches us we have to be so careful how we deal with strangers, how we relate to people. You never, ever know who it is God has chosen to be a blessing unto you. So you have to be careful sometimes how you talk to people. And we as believers sometimes talk down to folk, especially people that we view or consider being less than we are. So we have to be cautious that you never know who that person might be. Now, before I go any further, let us take a look now as we wrap this up of, of, of some examples. Throughout scripture, the word of God teaches us that angels are dispatched 
to minister unto us. God used angels to minister to his people. Let me prove this. I'm going to go to the Old Testament, and I want to talk for a moment about Daniel. Daniel. There's a statement uh, found in Daniel chapter 6, verse 22. It is here that God used an angel. How? This angel rescued Daniel from being devoured by lions. Listen to what the text says. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him and also, O king. Now think about this. I have done no wrong before you. Now, you may be thinking for a moment, well, that was a physical lion. But let me remind you that we may not be dealing with a wild lion on the loose, but the enemy is like lions. Scripture teaches and helps us say he walks around like a roaring lion seeking he whom he may devour. And there are moments that, that, that the enemy uses people. That means that there are people, there are individuals who, who dog us, mistreat us, say negative things, dig ditches, and hoping that you will fall into them. You don't have anything to worry about. The reason why is because just like he shut the lion's mouth that sought to destroy Daniel, he was shut the enemy's mouths. He didn't ask us to do anything against them. Got to be careful. Our focus when we find ourselves in the lion's den is to have a desire for God's presence. And if we have a desire for God's presence and allow him to come into our lives in such a way that we can rest in peace, God will take care of the lion's that surround our lives. If that's not enough, let me take you to Mark in the New Testament, chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. It is here that we recognize that the angel attended Jesus during his time of temptation in the wilderness. For the text says, immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beast. And the angels ministered to him. It's very important that we don't just jump into that text and focus directly on Jesus in, in the wilderness. Do not lose sight of the fact that in verse 12 of that verse, of that, that uh, section, I made mention is that he was led into, and we, we sometimes find ourselves in places the Holy Spirit didn't lead us to be in. We went on our own, but never lose sight. And that is, if you are in a strange place, this is not uh, giving you permission to go in the wrong direction. I just need you to understand all of us slip up. And find ourselves in places we have no business being in. But yet God is there with us. He was led by the spirit into the wilderness. And not only that. But we will find ourselves that moments in life. Our strange place becomes our wilderness. And that is I need to remind you that the angels again. Will meet our needs in our wilderness. If that's not enough, let me take you also to Luke chapter 22 and verse 43. It is here that the angel strengthened Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. For the text says that an angel appeared to him from heaven strengthening him. Now if Jesus needed strengthening, how much more should we as his children, nobody is so pseudo holy, so all that, that you don't need to be strengthened. We all get to a point in life that there are moments where we, we feel like we are moving on our last. But let me remind you, God once again 
steps in when we are at our lowest. Sometimes he allows us to drop down to our lowest so that when he steps in, we can't get an attitude that when we begin to rise back up, that is something that we ourselves did. But notice in the verse, the angels were used to minister to Jesus. And we must recognize that we as a follower of Christ need to be strengthened from time to time. Then finally, let me close by using the example of the Apostle Paul. In Acts chapter 27, verse 23, an angel encouraged Paul on board a ship in the midst of a storm. Listen to what the statement says. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve. Let me remind us now that just as Paul needed encouragement, there also is important for us to connect his encouragement with that of the storm. It is important, do not lose sight of this, that when you find yourself in a strange place, Sometimes we hang around the wrong folk and they provide for us wrong information. If I'm already in a strange place, I don't need to hang around other folk in a strange place that can't help me. All of us need a word of encouragement. So I want to remind us, as I come to a close, I want to remind us as we face these issues regarding coronavirus, sickness and deaths all across the country, everywhere. It is important that we stay encouraged. You ought to wake up every morning, although you are unable to come to church and, and do what you are capable of doing uh, Sunday after Sunday, Bible study. And, uh, now comes the time of what you do in your strange place. Satan might have the power to surround me in a, uh, a strange place, but what he cannot do is when my desire is for the Lord, I can praise God, worship God, get close to God in my strange place. I can sit down and have moments where I read God's word, and God's word will give you a word of encouragement. Before I leave, let me drop this one bullet in your spirit. When you're in your strange place, never lose sight of this. God can bless you in your strange place. Thank you so much for taking the time to pause and get into the word of God with you. We hope to see you once again on next Sunday at this same time. As we prepare to close, our closing meditation says, Dear Lord, now that we have heard your word, help us to become doers of the word by loving others, caring for the needy, and sharing the gospel. Once again, it is extremely important that uh, during this period of time where we are practicing social distancing, I need you to keep in mind, we are still yet the church. We are a church family. So if there are issues that may arise or situations or problems, keep in mind, you can call the church. If no one answers at that moment, leave a message. Phone number is 423-622-2077. May God bless and keep you all.
of my strength and power, Lord, you You're the one.